And I'm going to introduce our first speaker now. My uh, connection with Charlie Popper goes back over 20 years. He wrote the uh, developmental psychopharm <laughs> textbook that I used as a child psychiatry fellow at the University of New Mexico. And uh, I didn't come across his name again until 2001 when he published in the Journal of Clinical Psychiatry uh, the first publication on looking at an alternative approach, looking at uh, minerals um, other than lithium. And uh, I think that's been a, a pivotal publication and one that's been built on significantly since. Charlie Popper is on faculty at Harvard and McLean Hospital. He's from the Boston area. He's well published, well thought of, and he's, I think, a real driving force behind why all of us are here today. And I think he's been pivotal in, in pulling this conference off. And uh, I can tell you that from Boston to the mountains of Colorado, he's a stalwart uh, guy and uh, fun to be with. So it's my pleasure to introduce Charlie Popper. Um, I'm pleased to be asked to be a part of this, pleased to be able to, uh, honored to be able to be able to present sort of an initial overview uh, for this conference. Uh, it's been a long time coming and uh, there is going to be an enormous amount of material that you'll be hearing about in these next two days. Uh, someone's cell phone is going off. <laughs> now, why is this not advancing? There we go. Um, I have my obligatory hello slide, which basically says that I don't have a lot of money. Uh, I don't have a lot of conflicts of interest. Um, I, the, the closest thing to a conflict, if one calls this a conflict, is that I have talked with the, uh, Tony Stefan and David Hardy at True Hope for years about the work that they've been doing and we've been sharing our thinking. Uh, about some things, but in terms of independence, there's not a penny, not a single penny that I've received from them. Most of you know, many of you heard last night about their extraordinary saga in bringing this field to where it is right now. Uh, David's knowledge as a consultant to agribusiness applied to the plight of Tony Stephan's children who were struggling with bipolar disorder and frankly failing despite the best efforts of medicine. And their joint courage in applying David's nutritional knowledge to the treatment of Tony's children uh, is quite a tale. Uh, and how they got it to happen is quite extraordinary. Uh, their drive to make this happen is hard to believe. Uh, if you've seen the pits that they've been thrown in and that they hop out of and keep on going, uh, it's really an amazing story of extraordinary persistence in the face of, of extraordinary opposition. So anyway, it's their work. Oh, I missed Bonnie. Uh, their, their connection, uh, their fortuitous connection, although nothing is as accidental as it might seem. Uh, in being able to connect with Bonnie and her uh, extraordinarily organized uh, research laboratory in psychology has really made this entire, these three people have made this entire story happen. And it's their work over the last 10 years that is why we're here today. And I believe that their work is going to be, is already historically pivotal. Uh, in the changing the way that psychiatry will be practiced. Uh, make no mistake, this is a historically significant piece of work that's being done. Much of this conference, not all, but much of the conference will be discussing a very particular type of treatment that has grown out of the work that they've done, or that is really, the work has been done in examining uh, a particular type of broad spectrum micronutrient treatment, which basically consists of uh, a broad spectrum of vitamins and minerals, inositol, choline, and a few amino acids, uh, mostly at levels above the recommended daily allowance, uh, the numbers that define the minimal intake standards, uh, but that for the most part are below the dose limits defined as upper tolerable dose limits 
by the standard uh, setting agencies. <clears throat> so it's a nutritional formula that appears to work for bipolar disorder. Uh, and it's very interesting if we sort of reflect on this as a new entry into psychiatry, that it's a nutritional treatment that contains neither omega-3 fatty acids. It's a mineral treatment that does not contain lithium. As of now, as you will hear in more detail, there are no large-scale vigorously controlled studies yet to document either its safety or efficacy in treating any psychiatric disorder. Uh, the clinical techniques used right now are largely based on anecdote, personal experience, swapping information like we will be doing in this conference here. The, ch the uh, techniques are rapidly changing. Uh, undergoing constantly a uh, constant revision. So much of what you'll be hearing about will be a very different story in a few weeks or a few months. Despite the provisional nature of the clinical knowledge, the rapid change, despite the fact that we don't have controlled trials uh, documenting uh, this treatment, the treatment is nonetheless in very widespread use, despite there being very little actual hard data, even in bipolar disorder. So this is akin to what Scott was alluding to before, what child psychopharmacology looked like 25 years ago, where a lot of people were using the treatment and there was precious little to guide. This is not the first time that this has occurred. This is a routine part of medicine. Now, one of the things that's really fascinating about this treatment is that it's not exactly your standard FDA pharma-produced uh, uh, treatment. Uh, there's a prevailing medical mo model, as you know, that basically is sort of summed up in the one drug, one disease, one effect uh, kind of uh, notion of how a drug should work in a body. And the, uh, insulin, as an example, treating diabetics to raise blood sugar, a one, an easy-to-measure parameter, is sort of a standard way of being able to understand what uh, uh, the way a drug works. Whoops, don't want to. Now, if you take, uh, if, if instead of having a one-drug uh, system, you go to the FDA and say that you have two drugs that you want to be able to commercialize at, or, and that you want to be able to make into a treatment that becomes available. It's an extraordinary headache. The FDA does not like two drug products. They, uh, the amount of pharmacokinetic work that needs to be done when you vary the amount of one drug against the other doing dose response curves uh, in order to be able to document how the two drugs interact is a lot more complicated. And their question is always the same. Why do you need two drugs? Isn't that a lot? So imagine, just to go on a little bit of a fantasy ride, imagine you're, you're Tony and David, and you go to the FDA, and you say, hi, um, I'm Tony, I'm David. Uh, I have a 36-ingredient product that I'd like to use to treat bipolar disorder. So, uh, you know, they will say, uh, sure, <laughs> or something that sounds like sure. And um, they'll ask you, well, okay, so explain to me how these ingredients interact. So you start, and they start talking about, well, you know, what, what does the dose response curve look like? Well, as it turns out, you know, if you have, um, say if you're doing a dose response curve like this with five data points, uh, which is very, very minimal to sort of describe the action of the drug over a range of doses, and you do, th you do that with two different drugs, you basically wind up um, with uh, a much larger number of uh, uh, trials that you would need to do. Basically, you're doing five data points raised to the second power, 25, in order to be able to describe the way that that drug simply interacts with itself in uh, producing a particular kind of effect. So if you want to do the detailed pharmacokinetics of a 36-ingredient product, 
what you would need, and let's say it's only five data points, which is, as I say, very little, uh, you would need to do a fairly large number of uh, dose response curves. Uh, in fact, the number, uh, I uh, am not sure I'm even going to try to guess what that number is, is actually a lot, of, a lot of dose response curves to run, especially when you consider that it vastly exceeds the world economy in terms of numbers of dollars. And you don't run these things for one dollar at a time. So this would be, uh, this is the kind of thinking that Tony and David face, not just at the FDA, but as when they go to the medical world and people just scratch their heads, they can't begin to think about what is it that a 36 ingredient product actually is about. So my basic point is that conventional medical pharmacology just does not fit the field of broad spectrum micronutrient research. We need different ways of being able to conceptualize what this kind of treatment might look like. If you ask the question, what do micronutrients do to treat bipolar disorder? Well, um, you have a lot, of, a lot of problems in even being able to wrap your head around that kind of question. Uh, as you know, lithium has been around for 60 years. There are a lot of theories about how it works, but basically we really do not know what it is that lithium, one micronutrient, is doing to help in bipolar disorder. Now, we can get around this question very easily, uh, as it turns out, by noticing that there's no proven therapeutic effect of micronutrients in treating bipolar disorder. So any talk is purely speculative. Uh, there's not much point in really working on that question until one knows whether, in fact, the response is there. And if efficacy were proven, or once it is finally adjudicated. There'll be all kinds of questions about what are the active products? Do they work the same way in different people? Do you really need all of those ingredients? Or alternatively, do you really need to have a very broad spectrum product? Uh, and that's a real possibility, and it's one that right now all we can do is uh, think about. Now, would it be a deficiency? People often talk about, well, if you're giving mic micronutrients that are all over the system and it improves the functioning of the system, doesn't that mean that there must be a deficiency? Uh, well, deficiency is a slippery concept. Uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time on it, but obviously if you give uh, uh, psych uh, antipsychotic drug to a person and, and they get better, you don't infer, for example, that they had an olanzapine deficiency, and you can't really infer if lithium works that there's a lithium deficiency. There's another way of being able to think about this kind of issue, and that is if you take the example of chromium, which works to increase insulin, both chromium and vanadium both work to increase insulin sen uh, sensitivity. Uh, so if you give chromium to uh, a person and see that insulin resistance improves, does that imply that there's a chromium deficiency? Well, if you don't think about the rest of the system, you might very well come to that conclusion. But in fact, it might just be fixing a deficiency in the vanadium levels so that the Deficiency is really not something that you're thinking about or looking at. And there may be no actual deficiency of chromium in the first place. Uh, so this is uh, an issue of balance among different components. It's what might be considered a relative deficiency in a particular kind of setting or a functional deficiency. So you can have deficiencies in the absence of any actual deficiency in a uh, particular component. And there are all kinds of examples uh, of how uh, uh, different micronutrients play off against each other. And uh, here there are a couple of the obvious examples uh, that come to mind about the kind of balances that need to be maintained and that uh, are maintained uh, through the kinds of micronutrient products that we uh, are talking about.